welcome to Christmas Eve, those of you who can call Christmas Eve to church at home, and those who are joining us tonight for this event. Um, but let's begin as we begin all good things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, by your passion, death, and resurrection, you have brought about the salvation of the world. We pray that as Dr. White speaks to us tonight, that you may bless her words, and that you may open our hearts. So that we may, by meditating on your shroud, be brought to the glory of your resurrection. And we ask this in the words of your promise, our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for being here, Robert. You want me to walk with you? I'll That's be your good. microphone. Oh. <laughs> That's, That's all right. Okay. All right. Once again, good evening, everyone. I'm going to stand close. Oh, thank you. Sure, that'll work. I'm That's the true. microphone, too. Thank you, Dr. Wright. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Maybe I'm not the microphone. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to have you here tonight. My name is Brendan Dudley, and I work as the executive director of Price on Main, a storefront in downtown Greenville at 14 South Main Street. It's a Catholic resource center and spiritual oasis that we anticipate opening later this year in 2023. Price on Main is brought to you by the very past Catholic Information Center, and our storefront placed on Maine is co-hosting tonight's event with Friends of Peace. So you'll probably have seen a table when you came in with all types of flyers, materials, support cards, and donation envelopes to learn more about Christ on Maine and how you can get involved. So we thank you once again for having this event and co-hosting it with us. We're honored to have you here to learn all about how to grow closer to Jesus Christ through the shroud of Turin. And without further ado, okay. Dr. Lewis is going to speak with us about tonight's speaker, Dr. White, and all that we're going to be experiencing. But on a final note, in case I forgot, we do have two different fundraising opportunities tonight. One is a donation basket you saw when you came in for the Christ on Main storefront as we continue seeking financial support and volunteers. And we also are taking up a free will offering for Dr. White on the plate you see at her table over there. Thank you so much again, and without further ado, I will have Dr. White be introduced by Dr. Lewis. Thank you again. Good evening. I'm, uh, do my best to project. Uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, Aaron and I had the opportunity to hear Dr. White speak uh, when we were in our vestibule weekend with the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre in New Orleans. And you are in for a real treat tonight. The information she has to, to give to you, to partake to you, is absolutely incredible. And it will do nothing but further your faith in our Lord and His death and resurrection and His real presence in the Eucharist. Um, tonight, uh, after, after the uh, presentation, we do have a yours, dessert, and some wine to drink. Um, so please stay around and fellowship, hang out. We'll have a Q&A with Dr. White. Um, she is volunteering her time here to be with us. Um, and so we do ask if you, if you so felt called to leave a goodwill do um, a donation to her and her organization um, so that she can further their ministry. So. Dr. Cheryl White, Ph.D., is a professor of history at Louisiana State University at Shreveport, where she holds the endowed Humphrey, Hubert Humphreys Professorship. She's had a career-long interest in Shroud Studies, currently serves on the Board of Directors for the Shroud of Turin Education and Research Association, STERA, and has published and presented original research from the Vatican secret archives related to the history of the Shroud for international journals and conferences. Dr. White served as a historical consultant on the Shroud of Turin exhibit developed for the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And she's given several presentations there, as well as provided 
an international live stream presentation for the esteemed Smithsonian Institute, the institution last year, um, and their World History Certificate Program. Dr. White is a regular consultant on projects for the History Channel and a and Network on a variety of historical topics. She also was able to see the Shroud recently as part of a private event in Turin at the invitation of the Center for International Study of the Shroud and appears in the upcoming EW10 documentary that will air during Holy Week of 2024. Please welcome me and, and, and welcoming Dr. White to our Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's wonderful to be in South Carolina, but I have to tell you, it feels a lot like Louisiana. <laughs> I, was, um, I was surprised to find uh, so much that I have in common with your state, and uh, it feels very much like home. And you've been very, very wonderful. All of you have been. I was in Greenville a uh, night before last. I was in Columbia last night and back in Greenville tonight. So can everyone hear me OK? No real echoing going on? OK, good. Good. Well, I am really thrilled to be here, and before I actually begin, I, I always like to get a little bit of a feel for the room and for my audience. So, how many of you came tonight knowing absolutely nothing about this linen? I have a few. Okay. How many of you know a little bit about it? Good. Good, good. How many of you can get up here and give this presentation? <laughs> well, I just always like to know what I'm dealing with, as I said. I just like to know. So my journey with the Shroud began uh, a long time ago. Um, I always date myself in this part of the presentation, but that's OK. I was an undergraduate history major in the early 1980s when the very first peer-reviewed science about this cloth began to appear in academic it so happened that at that time, I was also a brand new Catholic. My first act of adult defiance at 18 was to go get baptized. <laughs> and it was a perfect sort of storm of events. Um, I was a young Catholic. Uh, I was a history major, so I was naturally drawn to the story of this linen. And um, Pope St. John Paul II was Pope, and he was like a rock star to me. Uh, he is the one who really helped lead this, this, um, this initiative to get the science um, behind the study of this. So that was the beginning of my journey with the Shroud. And then in 1988, when the Carbon-14 dating results were published, and every major newspaper around the world had the headline that the Shroud of Turin is a medieval going in and out here. the world that was the message that this was a medieval forgery and I, like many people I stepped back from the shroud and thought that perhaps uh, it was something medieval and, and as a medieval a graduate a graduate student at that point in time in medieval studies I thought this is great I'd love to know more about the artist more about the process know more about this fantastical one-of-a-kind piece of art in the world and so it never ever turned me loose and as a matter of fact, although I have been giving presentations, I'm, I'm giving presentations around the world, it's really only been in the last 10 years that I have seen a significant increase in the interest in this linen. And, and I'm going to hint at why I think that is in my presentation. My most recent adventure was that I had the great privilege and blessing of having 40,000 English-speaking encounters at World Youth Day in Lisbon, Portugal, with um, three presentations on the Shroud over the days that I was there. So uh, this is an ongoing story. My point of telling you that is that there's more interest in the Shroud today than I think there was 40 years ago, and I think you're going to see why. So for those of you that don't know anything about it, and I think there's a few of you, I sort of build this to the point where we walk through uh, the beginning, sort of the, the entry level, if you will, and get through to sort of where we are with Shroud scholarship today and, uh, and then I always try to leave some room for questions at the end. So this is a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth that we are talking about tonight, okay? And I've got, I actually have to tell you this, that, that um, what's interesting, of course, about it is that not that it's a linen, not even that it's a pretty linen, because it is, it's beautiful, I saw it last year. 
It's a beautiful piece of linen, but that's not why we're interested in it. We're interested in it because of the image that's on it. The image that's on this linen is a, is a, a perfect, anatomically perfect, and, and actually forensically accurate man who's about 5 foot 10 inches tall, weighed about 160 pounds. This man has been scourged with a very specific type of weapon. He was crucified. He was pierced in the right side, right between the fifth and sixth ribs, and he was capped on his head with something very thorny. Okay, so we're, and we're interested in the shroud. Why? Because of who this represents, yes? I don't think anybody in the world would look at this linen and say, oh, it's a man who's been, cru who's been crucified and scourged, pierced in the side and capped with thorns. I wonder who that might be. Okay? That's not the question. The question is how this forensically accurate, anatomically perfect image got on this linen. It is a process, and I'm going to go ahead and jump to the end and, and give something away. It is a process that we cannot reproduce in the 21st century in any laboratory in the world. We cannot do this. And believe me, many people have tried. And I've had them at my presentations. I've had them come up to me and say, I could do that in my microwave, right? I could do that with a laser. I could do it with an atomic bomb. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't try. But it is a forensically accurate, anatomically perfect image, and I cannot stress that enough to you. It is not a painting. It is not an artwork. It is not a drawing. It is not a photograph. And you're going to see why we know that, okay? It has been subjected to, we believe, more academic inquiry than any other object known to exist in the world today. That, I can't quantify that for you. I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands or millions of hours have been brought to bear on this cloth. But I can tell you that it's from every single academic discipline. Name one. The hard sciences especially. Forensics, especially the area of blood spatter and blood uh, flow forensics. Uh, chemistry, botany, hematology, biology, pollenology, dendrology, geology. Uh, textile experts have studied this claw. Historians weigh in. But nobody's really interested in the history I've found. <laughs> Nobody really wants to hear that part, so I'll save that for the end. Um, just, jo just joking. I have to give you a little history. Here's our challenge tonight. The way that academic inquiry works is that the more you study something, the more you begin to understand it. Yes? That's why we study things. We study them so we can understand them. The Shroud of Turin is an object that the more we study, the more we don't know. For every question we answer, there's a whole new set of questions. It never yields its secret. And the major secret we have is how the image got there. So this is actually the inverse of the way that academic inquiry works, which, which leaves us with a philosophical challenge right up front. It's unlike anything else we've ever studied in that regard as well. That's it. That's, you're looking at it right there. This is what you would see with your naked eye if you went to Turin, Italy, and you got to see it on public display. This is what you see. Uh, you can make out. Hopefully you can make this out. The frontal image, yes, the man's face here. And actually, I just realized this is inverted. <laughs> Y'all pretend it's upside down. Um, the man's face here, the back of the head here, the, the dorsal side of the body, the frontal side of the body, the hands are crossed here. I'll show this to you in a lot more detail. But this is what you would see. Now imagine for just a moment, I want you to put yourself in this perspective. This is always helpful. You are a medieval pilgrim, and you are crawling on your hands and knees down the aisle of a church, either in Lyre, France, or after it moved to Turin in 1578, and you are going to venerate a cloth that somebody in authority told you was the burial linen of Christ, and you believed it. Because you know that this is how the medieval mind worked? They didn't know what we know to be skeptical. That came about because of the Enlightenment. They believed because someone told them, and this is all they ever saw. They didn't know what you're getting ready to know. And yet, they believed because someone told them that that's what this was. Okay? 
Now, to orient yourself to how this image got here, I want to show you an animation that, that um, we developed for the exhibit at the Museum of the Bible that really helps people orient themselves to the image and to how we're talking about a 14 and a half foot strip of cloth having an image on both sides. Actually, it's not on both sides. You'll see how. Imagine a body being enshrouded this way. Okay? Now, somehow, by some process we do not understand fully, that's really not true, we understand how it got there, we don't understand how to recreate it. What you're looking at is the enshrouding of this man so that there is a process by which the front side of his body was imprinted on one part of the linen, the back side of his body is imprinted on the other in perfect anatomic detail. Okay, does that help, that help sort of visualize that? Now, you had to know when you were having a history professor come, you were going to get a little bit of history lesson, and you just have to indulge me here. I know you want the science, but I was a humanities major, okay? So you're just going to have to put up with this a little bit. So the, the Estrada enters the documented history in 1350, technically in 1353. In 1355, it went on public display for the first time in Lyre, France. I am not in any way suggesting to you that this cloth did not exist before 1355, and I want to be very clear that everyone hears me say that. What I'm saying when I talk about the documented timeline is this is what historians have. We can apply our method, historical method, which is, requires a written record that we can produce with certainty for a chain of custody right through today, okay? So I am not suggesting it was not in existence before 1355. I am telling you, I can tell you where it's been every day since 1355. Is that helpful? And if we get that far, and I actually get to talk about some of the missing history tonight, which I'm hoping to, uh, you'll see what, I'm, what, I, what I mean by this. Okay, so it's in the possession of a knight, a knight named Geoffrey de Charny. Geoffrey de Charny uh, does not tell us in any living, surviving document how he came to possess it. We don't know how he got it, but he put it on public display in a little church in Lyrae and said it was the burial linen of Christ. The next thing that happens in its history is the de Charny family transferred its ownership in 1453 to the House of Savoy. Some of you might remember way back, if you had a little bit of European history a long time ago, the House of Savoy was one of the minor dynastic families of Europe. They married into a lot of the major families of Europe, but they produced, eventually produced the titular kings of Italy. Yeah? Um, the last of whom was King Umberto II, who died in 1983. The Savoy family owned the linen from 1453 until 1983. The Savoy family, it was in private hands. And in 1983, King Umberto II willed it to the living Pope, who was Pope St. John Paul II. He owned it as an individual. It did not get, it, it in no way belongs to the institutional Catholic Church, and I think a lot of people are always surprised to hear that. This is not a, a relic that belongs to the church. It belongs to the Pope as an individual. So today, its owner is Pope Francis. Okay? As an individual. He has a custodian in Turin, the Archbishop of Turin, who maintains custody of this relic on behalf of the Holy Father. And the Archbishop, therefore, also has a custodial team that maintains it every single day. Which is another whole fascinating story about its maintenance. The reliquary that this is in today, which I had the, the opportunity to see last year, was designed by NASA. You can shoot the shroud into outer space and it can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and not burn up. If you took nothing else away tonight, maybe you'll remember that. Um, my point is that it, it passed to the Savoy family and in, four, in, excuse me, in 1532, the Savoy family had the shroud stored in a niche in the wall behind the altar of their private chapel in Chambéry, which I'm going to show you, their little private chapel on the grounds of their chateau. This is a photograph of the niche I'm talking about in the wall. The shroud was folded up into a metal reliquary 
and there was a fire. The Franciscan community that was taking care of the shroud then rushed into the chapel to rescue the fire. They did not get to it before the metal had heated up and left what you see, if you go back and look at this, uh, well actually you can see it on this, the parallel set of scorch marks that run the entire length of the linen are from this 1532 fire. Very, one of the very most characteristic things you'll notice about the shroud when you see it uh, up close, really, you can really see it, the scorch marks. Now, here's what's interesting about that. The shroud was actually in another fire, by the way. It was another fire in 1997 uh, that also did not damage the image uh, uh, on the linen. But in, um, in the 1532 fire, the, the poor Clare community, the sister order to the Franciscans, undertook what they believed was going to be a very loving repair. Uh, they stitched on a backing cloth. They sewed patches on the linen, which you can see the, the triangular shaped patches. Those were actually not even removed from the linen until 2002 as part of a uh, restoration that took place in Turin in, in that year. They also, we learned in the um, early 80s, we learned that the poor Clares had done an invisible reweave in, in certain areas of the cloth. This is very important, this, this 1534 uh, repair, because if you look at the cloth under ultraviolet light, which we did not know about until the 20th century, by the way, if you look at the cloth under ultraviolet light, what you see is a homogeneous color. It's all this sepia-toned linen, just like you're looking at, this, this flax linen that you're looking at. Well, when they looked at it the first time under ultraviolet light, they noticed something very odd. It's all that homogeneous color except for one area of the linen. The top left corner fluoresces a bright green, which immediately tells us there's something chemically different about that part of the cloth. Upon further examination, what has been determined is that the Poor Clares, most likely the poor Clares, did this because it was a common um, uh, medieval and, and early modern practice of doing a very, very specific kind of reweave. It's called an invisible weave, so that you can't see it with the eye until you turn the linen over and really examine it. Then you can see the knots and the snarls from the work. Now, this is important because that top left corner. If you, guys, if I was talking to my medieval Europe class right now, I'd be saying, everybody write this down because this is a test question, okay? <laughs> the top left corner of this linen underwent a reweave. They introduced new cotton, not linen. They introduced cotton, which is chemically not the same. So they look different when they're fluoresced. Does that make sense? Okay, so hold that thought because you can see why that's important. Now, the next thing that happens is in 1578, um, the Savoy family moved it to Turin, Italy, because they were actually, the family dynastically was centered in the Piedmont region of northern Italy. It was kind of a perfect uh, nexus, if you will, between France, the Swiss Alps, and, oh, by the way, there was this rather a prominent uh, cardinal archbishop of Milan who had just been a great champion of reform at the Council of Trent, and he wanted to go and venerate the shroud. So they brought it to Turin for him to, 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 to have it, to venerate it. Uh, that cardinal archbishop was St. Charles Borromeo, by the way. So we actually have it documented in history on the day that St. Charles Borromeo venerated the linen in Turin, Italy, and it has never left. It is still there today in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist today. All right, so let's fast forward a long way into the future. 1898. There's an amateur photographer by the name of Secunda Pia who goes to the Savoy family and asks if he can photograph the shroud. He's an amateur, okay? I'll stress that again. He's trying out his new camera. Look at that sophisticated technology, right? You should have seen me at World Youth Day trying to explain negative photography. <laughs> But I found the secret. There's, there's a setting on the iPhone that everybody could relate to. So um, you can do it on your iPhone. But I saw some really puzzled looks when I, started, when I started talking about negative photography and glass plates and, you know, the eyes started to glass over. But many of you know what I'm talking about. 
Secundapia's camera, which you see here, um, actually took a prolonged exposure on a 12-inch glass plate, and then he took this into a dark room to process it chemically. So for those of you that don't understand this, it takes a minute, okay? It takes a little time to, to bring the image out of the glass. So he's in the dark room, and he's the very first one in the world. Now remember to keep yourself in the perspective of the medieval pilgrim, right? They never knew and never saw what Secundapia saw for the very first time. These are his plates, okay? He saw this for the very first time. And Secundapia was accused of having created a hoax. Because, again, speaking of inverses, which we do a lot when we talk about the shroud, this is the inverse of the way photography works. Do you understand that when you look at the shroud with your eye, you see you're looking at a mirror image. You're actually looking at the photographic negative when you look at it in its positive form. When you take a photographic negative, you are now looking at the positive image of the man. It's a mirror image. He was accused of having created some kind of a hoax. Well, it was 33 years before the Savoy family allowed the shroud to be photographed a second time because this caused such a sort of a controversy. The second time it was photographed in 1931 by a professional photographer named Giuseppe Henriet, he got the exact same result. And every photographer ever since has gotten the exact same result. You can see the, the image of the man in all of its complexity and all of its detail down to the stunning intricacies under microscopic examination of every single wound on his body. Stunning detail. Okay, so fast forward again. 19, the, the 20th century is obviously going to be an age of science. So in 1976, there was a um, nuclear physicist at the Air Force Academy by the name of Dr. John Jackson, who was working with jet propulsion laboratories to develop some technology. It's called a VP8 analyzer. And y'all, when I tell you it's technology, <laughs> I have a VP-8 in Shreveport. It's part of a collection that I have. And I can tell you that, that I can't even find cables to hook it up to analog televisions. I mean, that's, it's, it's really not technology to us. But it was at the time. And in 1976, um, what, what Jet Propulsion Labs was interested in doing was being able to read photographs that are coming back from satellites of stars or planets to be able to read them for dimension. So for instance, if you took a photograph of the surface of the moon, you would have uh, sort of a, this flat one-dimensional image. Can we, is there a way we can tell, if, is that a valley, is that a crater, is that a mountain on the moon, to read that image for dimension? Does that make sense? It's like it's looking for spatial relationships. Yeah? So they did all sorts of controls and all sorts of tests, and Dr. Jackson, uh, actually, they had run some artworks through it, the Mona Lisa. Okay, let's look at a photograph of the Mona Lisa. And any photograph of an artwork produces a severe distortion. Any photograph of a human being produces a distortion. Okay? But when he suggested they take a photograph of the shroud, he knew this photographic property existed. So he was curious to see how it would perform in a test like this. So they took a photograph of the shroud and ran it through this VP8 analyzer, and the result that they got caused, caused Dr. Jackson to look at everybody in the room and say, we are taking a team of scientists to Turin. Pack your bags. Because this is what they got. Now let me tell you why this is important. What this means, and the simplest way to explain this to you, is that the density of the image is directly related to the portion of the body it touched or came close to. So in other words, the nose comes right out in 3D relief because the, the cloth was draped there. The back of the legs at the knee, you don't really have much image. You'll see the knees were flexed. 
The cloth didn't touch that area of the body. There is a spatial relationship that is directly proportional to the distance from the body. And the result is a three-dimensional form. Perfect 3D relief. This photographic property of the shroud, the fact that your eye sees the photographic negative and not the positive, and the fact that the cloth itself has three-dimensional information embedded in it, sets it apart from anything else you will ever see, photographically or image-wise. It is completely unique. There is nothing else in the world like this image. Now, the linen itself, to give you even more, kind of more of a mind-boggling aspect of this, the image itself is very superficial. But yet, you just heard me say that it contains all of the complexity of the man, right? So how do we hold those two things? Get in your mind a thread. A thread. Can you image a thread? Imagine that every thread in a linen would have 100 fibers to it, and every fiber of a thread would have 100 fibrils. Now you're down to a microscopic level. This image is only on the very top fibrils of this linen. You could scrape it off with a razor blade. It is so superficial. And yet, it is three-dimensional. It contains all of this very specific information. Okay? That is it. The one, that is only one of the 17 characteristics, or more, some would say there are more, that you have to meet to say you can reproduce this. Now, the Shroud of Turin Research Project in 1978 um, it's the only time that the cloth has ever been permitted to be uh, scientifically examined. Uh, scientists, a team of about three dozen, uh, went to Turin. They had five days of access. They brought the shroud to them in the royal palace uh, at Turin, the Savoy Royal Palace. They brought it on a stainless, uh, stainless steel uh, table uh, with, held with, down with magnets. And they spent the next five days doing every single test they could think of to do. They were allowed to take textile samples. They were allowed to take what appeared to be blood. Nobody knew it was blood, but it appeared to be blood. They were allowed to take samples of that. They were allowed to take soil. They actually vacuumed the shroud and took soil and then put that in a little plastic bag and labeled it dirt. That's a real scientific name. Because nobody knew in 1978 that soil has unique signatures microscopically that point to a specific geographic zone, right? Nobody knew that in 1978, but somebody had the foresight to think that maybe that would be important one day. And indeed, it has proven to be very important that that was saved. They took pollen samples from the linen. 56 different ones were identified. Between 1973, the first samples were taken, and then again in 1978, they took more samples to corroborate what had been done previously. They did everything they could do. The, and the image you're looking at here is actually Dr. John Jackson. He is looking, getting the very first look. I told you about that holland, but the backing cloth that was on it, they're pulling that apart so they can see between the backing cloth and the linen itself. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read that because, you know, God, I can't read that, so how could you? But um, I, I put this here so that I won't forget to say something. When all of this began to be published in the early 1980s, when they, when they took their samples and went back to the United States and performed all sorts of tests, they began to publish, and as I said, there's over three dozen peer-reviewed journal articles about this that you can still find from this 1978 research project. The summary of their findings was um, all sorts of quantifiable things, but the big question was how the image got there, which they could not answer only confirming that it was not a photograph, it was not a painting, there are no paints or dyes or pigments of any kind on the cloth to account for the image. They identified the image actually as a chemical reaction in the linen, flax linen fibers itself that produced a sugar. It's saccharide, it's sugar, is what its chemical composition is. And it is... Um, um, they left, sort of left the question as, we can answer all these things about what it is not, but we can't tell you what it is. So, 
We know that this is an anatomically accurate image of a man who, as I said, has been crucified. He's scourged. He's capped with something thorny on his head, pierced right in the right side, right here between the fifth and sixth ribs, large puncture wound in the side that has a blood and some sort of clear fluid separation that's even visible to the naked eye on the shroud. You can see that. It's the largest wound really on the body. Uh, it is um, interesting that the body is in a state of rigor mortis, and I'm going to show that to you. Remember the 3D information, the spatial information I told you we can extract from the shroud? So we know that the body is in a state of what appears to be rigor mortis, which gives us a time of death window, right? This wrapped a real human form. The VP8 analysis proves that. You wouldn't have spatial information in an artwork. It wrapped a real human form. So the body's in rigor mortis. You see one wrist is pierced. You can see the, excuse me, the left wrist you can see. You don't get to see the right wrist because it's hidden from view. The arms were forced into this position, and we know that from some flexion in the musculature of the upper body. The hands were forced into this position over the pelvis, presumably as an act of modesty. And so the, the right wrist is covered. You don't see that. There's a large puncture wound at the feet. There are over, um, a, well, between 50 and 100 puncture wounds in the top of the head, uh, the forehead, and the nape of the neck, and there, which are all a pretty much identical uh, type of, of instrument that caused that. And there are 360 individual wounds on the body. And if you look at these wounds, these small wounds on the body, 360 of them, covering the entire, beginning at the neck, going all the way down the back, the buttocks, the back of the legs, the calves, even the feet, the front of the body to about the mid-chest region, um, not too much in the, in the, in the, in the mid-chest region, uh, and then again from about the hips down on the front. This man was beaten with a specific kind of weapon. We know exactly what it must have looked like because of the forensic examination of the wounds. You can look at them microscopically and they're all identical. This was a whip that had three leather straps and at the end of each of those leather straps, or some type of strap, we presume leather because of the, the wounds, there is a, uh, there's two metal balls. Somewhat irregular, they're not identical, but the wounds they leave are all consistent. And this man was beaten by two men. There was one on either side of him. Each one had this weapon. And one of the men was taller than the other. And we know that forensically because of the directionality of the wound. So this is all like CSI information you would admit in a court of law. This man was beaten with this type of weapon. The, 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 the men who inflicted these wounds on him, this was their heights. Okay? We know that when this man was struck by these two men who were beating him, he was not upright. He was bent over at the waist. And probably, there's a little bit of speculation about this. We're not, this is not peer-reviewed. There's speculation. We know he was bent over at the waist, but that his hands were tied in front of him. Okay? That's the most horrific thing about this, by the way. When you look at the overall wounds, these are the ones that are the hardest ones to see, to look at. Very, very vivid, very vivid detail. It is blood stained. The blood was present before the image. Now, just, I'm just going to let that settle with you for a minute. The blood was on the linen before the image got there. So the man bled, and then the image was created. Okay? There, I said, no paints or dyes, lots of pollens. We took soil, and we know that aloe and myrrh are both present in measurable quantities uh, on the shroud. Okay, so that is the forensic adaptation. Uh, in 3D form, the position of the body, the wounds on the body are represented. You can see the brutality of this crime scene, can't you? You see the large wound in the wrist here. You see the wound in the right side. The body is very badly beaten. Both knees are badly bruised, but the right one especially was bruised, indicating that this man fell at least once. 
Um, the feet are, in, are flexed. You can see the feet, the knees are flexed. The head is flexed, which indicates rigor mortis, which can give us kind of a dating. This, this would have happened between uh, two to three hours after his death and up to about a 48 to 72 hour window. So within about a three day window is when this image was formed on the linen for the man to have still been in rigor mortis. Okay, so the cloth itself is super interesting, by the way. I wish, um, I wish we got to talk about this a little more. The, um, I mentioned to you how beautiful it is. So the thing, interesting thing about textiles in the ancient world and in the medieval world, whether you thought this was an ancient cloth or a medieval cloth, looming doesn't change for over a thousand years. We're still using the same process in the Middle Ages they were using in the ancient world. What's the simplest way to create a cloth on a hand loom? You hang a vertical thread, and then you take a horizontal thread, and you do what? Yeah, one over, one under, one over, one under. It's the cheapest, um, fastest way to, to mass produce cloths um, using either linen, well, primarily linen, obviously, uh, at the time period that we'd be talking about either one here. Linen producing a much finer, finer cloth, whether it's from flax or from seed. But this particular cloth is not that. It is an unusual linen. It is a three over one herringbone weave that is stunning to the eye. You can see the weave with your eye. It's beautiful. Whoever owned this cloth was somebody of means, somebody who had money, who could procure such a fine burial linen was not something that you went down and you bought at the local discount store, um, you know, just rushed down to buy one. This was something that, that was planned. This was, this was someone of means. I will leave that thought with you. It's a very expensive linen, very unusual linen. The blood on the shroud is human. We didn't know that in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1980s, we determined that it was primate blood and then later determined it was human blood. And you see it was only very recently, in the last decade, that we have identified it as a very specific type. It is type AB. It is male. Uh, we don't know anything else. We cannot get any kind of DNA sequence. We don't know any of the genetic information about this man. But we know that it is type AB. Don't even have an RH factor. But I suspect that this is something that future scientists will continue to work on and may be able to, with advancing technologies, will be able to learn more about this. The interesting thing about the blood type is that this is the rarest blood type in the world. And I think you'll see why I'm making this point. So I don't know how many people are here tonight. How many people do you think are here? Okay, so 300. Let's say 300. All right. So statistically, there should be nine people in this room who have AB blood. Who are you? I got one here. Anybody else? Y'all just don't know your blood types. <laughs> because statistically, this should bear out. It's about 3% of the population. So I, like last night, I was at USC, and I had 100 people in the room, right? And one hand went up. And then they said, of course, they're college students, and they're going, Mom, what is my blood type? Like they're texting home to find out. Um, but statistically, that would bear out. Now, if it is type AB negative, that's even rarer. That's the rarest blood type in the world, about 1% of the population. My point of telling you this is, this is a forensic match. It's the same blood type of another cloth that's held in Oviedo, Spain, that has a fascinating history to it, okay? This cloth in Oviedo, Spain, you see, is also blood-stained. It's a very simple linen, not very expensive. The story behind this, we actually have very good historical provenance for this. This linen, excuse me, this cloth, it is linen, but it's a simple cloth, showed up in Oviedo, Spain in the year 613 in advance of the Persian invasions coming into the Holy Land, coming into Jerusalem, Christians were getting relics out of the Holy Land, and they took this one to a religious community in Oviedo, Spain. Why northern Spain? Because it was in a reliquary that was purported to have belonged to the Apostle James. 
right? Who has a, there's a great devotion to James, Santiago, right, in northern Spain. They took it to northern Spain, and, and this religious community receives this ancient reliquary. They recorded its receipt in the records of their community, and then they didn't open it for like 400 years. <laughs> and when they opened it, somebody said, oh my gosh, this is bloodstain. Look at this. But when it was received into the community there, purported to belong to the Apostle James, purported to be the Sudarium, which is what it is known by still, the Sudarium. The word is the same in Latin as it is in Greek, and where you find this is in John's Gospel, chapter 20. When John and Peter run to the tomb, do you remember the story? Okay, John is the only one of the evangelists that tells us this. He's the only one who gives us this detail. Peter and John run to the tomb. John outruns him, remember? So John gets there and hangs back and waits for Peter to go in. Yeah, we could talk a whole lot about that, but we won't. <laughs> Peter goes in, and then John says he went in. And what does John say that the others do not tell us? We saw the burial linen, the othonia is the Greek word he uses. We saw the burial linen lying there. The word lying is a word in Greek that means undisturbed, by the way. It was lying as if it had not been disturbed. We saw the burial linen lying there, including, he says, the cloth that had covered his head that was rolled up in a separate place by itself. Okay, now let's put this in some context of a crucifixion. Jesus' crucifixion, because that's what John's describing. John's describing what he saw in the tomb. Somebody wrapped Jesus' head when he came down from the, cloth, I mean, the cross immediately. Would have wrapped his face, wrapped his head with something because that was Jewish sensibility. The man had just died a brutal death. You covered his face immediately and soaked up the blood. Every working man in this part of the world carried a sweat cloth. They either wore it around their head, they had it stuck in a pocket, had it stuck, it stuck in a tunic, they carried it with them because that's what it was. It was a sweat cloth. You wiped your sweat with it. Someone had this handy when they brought him down from the cross, they covered his face with it, and because now it has blood and body fluid on it, it is technically part of the body. You know, for the Jews, blood is the body. So it had to be in the tomb. What John describes is an authentic Jewish burial. And that's what this linen is purported to be. So, what's interesting about this? There's over a hundred points of forensic congruity in the blood flow and blood spatter on this cloth and the one that's in Turin, Italy, which is more than twice what you would need to testify in a court of law that these cloths covered the face of the same man. They are both type AB, what are the odds of the rarest blood type in the world and you've got two claws centuries apart with the same blood type? And oh, by the way, there's a blood stain on here. I can point it out to you. You see that one right there? It's almost the shape of a cross. It is identical. You can line it up microscopically with one on the back of the shroud. It's identical. Type AB, just to go into a little bit of weeds here, type AB blood is the type of every Eucharistic miracle that has been forensically studied, including the one in Lanciano, including the one at Buenos Aires. Uh, while Pope Francis was archbishop there, he had one, they had one uh, miracle there that was forensically investigated independently of the church. Uh, it is type AB, and so is a recent one in Tixla, Mexico. They're all type AB. What are the odds? What are the odds? I can tell you that they're the billions and trillions to one, that you would have that many things bearing the same blood type, related somehow to the same person. Okay, the plant evidence is pretty, pretty compelling. There's 56 different pollens that have been identified. This is a little bit uh, in flux right now. New, uh, there's a new generation of pollenologists who are kind of going back and looking at this anew. Uh, some of the pollens that were identified in 1978 1973 and then again in 1978 that Dr. Donneen of Hebrew University published 
Some of them have they sort of backed up and said there might be a broader geographic zone for some of these. Um, not really calling into question his findings at all. But there are three of them that are found only one place in the world together, and that's in the zone you see right there in the center, right and around the city of Jerusalem. It's the only place in the world you would find those three specific pollens together. The, the one that you see here, Gondelia tornaforti, uh, is a blooming thorn. It blooms throughout the Middle East in the spring. It produces about a soccer ball size bloom, and when it, when it dries up, it leaves behind a mass of thorns. And these thorns are about uh, one and a half to two inches long, about a quarter of an inch thick. So imagine how big the, this mass of thorns would be. That is the dominant and most readily identified pollen on the shroud at the head, the neck, and the shoulder area. Gundelia torn 40. This limestone I told you about, the soil I told you about is limestone. We know now, a very specific type of limestone. It's travertine aragonite. I'm so glad they put that in that little Ziploc baggie and labeled it dirt. Because now we know, and we've known this for a while, about the last uh, 15, 16 years or so, that the travertine aragonite, this one has a very specific geographic fingerprint, and it's probably not going to surprise you to know, the closest match for it signature-wise, microscopically, is the old city of Jerusalem. This is soil that was vacuumed from the feet area, the knees, and especially the face. The largest concentration of dirt was at the, at the bridge of the nose and the eye sockets, right here, leading some to speculate that whoever this man was had face planted because he had so much dirt in his face and around the hairline area. Now here is the sticky little widget, right? What you were looking at there is the photograph from the press conference in 1988 announcing the carbon-14 dating results of the shroud, okay? Now, I don't know how well y'all can see that in the back. See, I like being in South Carolina. I can say y'all and you don't care. Um, <laughs> when I was at World Youth Day, I had some young people come up to me from Scotland and say, are you sure you're speaking English? It's <laughs> <laughs> just a little perspective for you, right? I don't know how well y'all can see that back there, but can you see anything on the board, the blackboard behind them? Where they've written 1260 to 1390. Do you notice anything? Because this photograph has always bothered me. There is an exclamation point. Okay, so you know my joke about this is that I was a humanities major and I realized I had some limitations. I didn't spend much time in the science building. But what I want to know is, is this something I missed? Is this some kind of scientific notation I didn't know about? Because to me, this smacks of bias. Science is an objective measure of the natural world. That's what it is. It's an objective measure. It is a rigorous method that's designed to reach the truth. Why do you have to punctuate it? So that always bothered me. And what you're looking at here is this is at the press conference. Um, the representatives from the three universities who were allowed to carbon-14 date the shroud. It's the University of Oxford, the University of Zurich, and the University of Arizona in the United States. The protocol that they filed was that each laboratory would receive two samples. There would be six samples taken from across the linen, from different areas, not touching upon the image. Uh, from different areas, because carbon-14 obviously is a destructive process, you have to burn it to measure the burn time to get a dating. They would do their test separately, they would come back together, and they would publish their results. So that's this day in 1988, 1260 to 1390. Well, a lot of people sort of stepped back, and, and including me. I was in graduate school, I remember this very well, and I'm thinking, well, okay, that's mind-blowing. What medieval artist did this? Because I went off on about a 10-year sort of, you know, little rabbit trail trying to think about this. Who could do this and how? Well, a lot of people didn't let go of it, including a scientist by the name of Dr. Ray Rogers, who was on the original, uh, original uh, SERP team. He was actually, he was an atheist. But he was a chemist, and he was interested in good science, and he said, something just doesn't feel right here. Because by this time, by the time he's publishing in 2003, there is all sorts of information coming out about 
um, the blood, and we knew about the soil. We, we, we didn't know, yeah, we knew about the soil by then. We knew about uh, the pollens. He says it's just something that doesn't add up. This is too complex. The image itself is too complex to argue for a medieval date. This doesn't make any sense. So he wanted, he was hoping he could prove what he suspected, but he couldn't because he didn't have access to the data. So in 2019, there was a young French lawyer by the name of Tristan Casabianca who um, was very interested in the carbon-14 dating. He'd actually converted to Christianity because he went to a talk on the Shroud. He was raised in an atheist home, unchurched, and this is really a turning point in his life. I mean, I've heard his story. I know Tristan very well. And um, he was with me in Turin last year, as a matter of fact. So um, he called up the British Museum because the British Museum is the custodian of all the raw data from the 1988 test. And he said, hey, I'm, you know, this is who I am and this is why I want to know and um, I'd like to see all the raw data from the test. And they told him no. So he sued them. <laughs> the <laughs> British Museum, under the International Freedom of Information Act, forced them to release the data and then, to Oxford's credit, they published it. Archaeometry Journal, they published it. And it is an indictment of the scientific method. So they took one sample, they took one square, and they cut it into six pieces. OK? Again, the humanities major would say to you, even I know that's not the same thing as taking six samples. Taking six, taking one sample and cutting it into six pieces is not the same thing, right? You can't slide that past me. You had 14 and a half feet of linen, and where did you take the one sample from? Y'all paying attention? <laughs> the top left corner. The part of the shroud that everybody knew in 1988 was chemically different from the entire rest of the claw. Now do you understand maybe why there's an exclamation point? Could there have been a little bit of bias in this process from the very beginning to produce a later date for this claw? So, we are now faced with the very real possibility again, and this is the first time since 1988, that we have the very real scientific possibility we're talking about a cloth that is far older. And as a matter of fact, there's some experimental work that's going on a couple of places in the world. Uh, one of them um, I'll just mention because it's getting a lot of, of internet attention. Uh, it has for the last year or so. Uh, there's a group at the University of Padua in Italy that's working on an environmental dating method that is non-destructive. They have some fibers of the shroud that were taken in 1978 that they're allowed to use for testing. And that group of engineers has done some preliminary tests with different objects. Uh, including the shroud, and they have come up with a date of about 100 AD plus or minus 100 years. Um, that is not, and we're very clear to say this, especially since this is being live streamed, that has not really been much peer reviewed yet. So it's a little early to call it a scientific finding. But it is interesting to us that there are people in the world that are working on methods to date objects, organic matter, that does not involve a destructive process, because that's going to be crucial to the, to the future of the shroud. If there's ever going to be any more testing, it's going to have to be something that's non-destructive. All right. Image formation, that's the biggest question we have. I, 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 I don't know what to tell you, uh, except we are now entering um, the twilight zone. <laughs> we are now entering the realm of something that is theoretical. Okay? And I want to stress this to you. This is theoretical physics, because we cannot reproduce this in a laboratory but it can be measured. We just can't do it. Does that make sense? Just because you can measure it doesn't mean you can do it. We can't do this. But this image is there in a way that, that we can sort of reel back and suggest some hypotheses for. Because if you can't match the 17 specific characteristics you have not recreated this process. Does that make sense? So when you go to your garage or use your microphone, uh, a microphone, your microwave, 
or your laser or whatever you're going to do, you've got to check these 17 things off. Okay? There is one process that produces all 17. And arguably there are more. There are more characteristics that have to be met than just these 17 that Dr. Jackson identified. Dr. Jackson's fall-through hypothesis as a nuclear physicist is this, that the body that was wrapped in the linen became materially transparent, pure light. But it was a light that did not burn because the reaction that it has with the linen is to leave behind this residue that is sugar. It's a very gentle light, and it is um, a light that happened in an immeasurable millisecond. The body became materially transparent. It had all the form of a man, but none of the mass. So the cloth simply collapsed straight along the plane of gravity right through the human form, capturing the image on the frontal and the dorsal side explaining that bizarre aspect of this and explaining why there's no side image. You don't see the side of the man's body. Okay? Explains why the head appears to be connected. The front and back of the head are connected. Explains that. Explains a lot. It actually explains all of them. So obviously you see we're talking about theoretical physics. We can't prove this because we can't do it. We cannot recreate it. At least not in 2023. Okay, so we're left with two conclusions. This is either really the burial cloth of Christ, and what you are looking at is a physical remain of what is perhaps the greatest metaphysical event ever. Well, that's not, qual that's not qualified. It is the greatest metaphysical event ever. If this is a physical remain of a resurrection, some type of metaphysical supernatural event that caused a light, that, that left a residue of sugar on a linen cloth, with all the complexity of the human form that was in there, okay, the cloth is either that, or it's, it's the only other thing it can be. This is not a multiple choice question, by the way. It's like true or false. <laughs> you have two choices. It's either that, or it is an artwork. And if it is an artwork, either ancient or medieval, it was created by an artist who is unknown to us, in a process that is unknown to us, and this is an artist who had advanced knowledge of botany and blood spatter forensics and negative photography. At least 700 years before we knew them. Okay? It is one of those two things. And it really can't be anything else. So what I think you're seeing, or hope you're seeing, is that in this linen... It's very humbling because we confront the limits of our human capacity, our ability to know things. And look, I'm an academic. I'm an academic. I live in this world, and I can tell you that there's nothing that we hate worse than confronting something we can't figure out, right? Which would lead some scholars to say, oh, well, you know, it's just um, my, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted it. I've heard that. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, it was being displayed 100 years before Leonardo was born. So he was very gifted, but he was not that gifted. <laughs> it is not camera obscura. It is not that medieval process, because believe me, I know that I'm a medievalist. I can tell you about camera obscura, and it does not produce this kind of detail. So we confront the limits of our human capacity. Science can lead us this far. It can answer everything you want to know about the blood about the pollen, about the textile. It can answer questions about the soil. One day we may have a DNA sequence on this man. But what does science not able to answer for you and will never be able to answer? How this happened. If this was a resurrection event, don't look to science. Science is a natural measure. It's a great one. It measures natural phenomena. It measures the natural world. Science does not extend to the supernatural. So if this is a supernatural event, people, you have another question you have to ask yourselves. What is the question? Who do you say that I am? We are at a nexus of two ways of knowing. We have our empirical, rational, scientific mind 
that has brought everything it can to bear on this cloth. And we are confronted with a question of faith. A question that calls for an answer based in something other than the natural. Okay? That's where we are today, anyway. That's where we are. The limits of our human capacity. And you know what? The great, beautiful thing about that is that whenever you are in the presence of something you don't understand, we call that mystery, you are already in the presence of something greater than yourself. Just by admitting you are in mystery. Okay. Now, I do want to, to run through something real quickly with you. Um, because I didn't get to talk about this either in Greenville the other night or I didn't get to talk about it in Columbia last night. So I'm, you're going you're gonna to have to listen to this because I want to talk about it. This is, um, <laughs> this is actually, this is my research. And it's, it's, it's kind of at the point in the, in the presentation I never get to. So um, indulge the academic for just a minute. And let me tell you that if you, if you look at sort of the environmental journey that the Shroud has been on, this has always interested me because I can tell you where it's been based on the forensic evidence. We know that it's been in Jerusalem. We know it was in Antioch because there's pollens that place it there. We know that it was in Edessa. We know that it was in Constantinople, somewhere near the Straits of the Black Sea. All that is environmental evidence that we have in the linen itself. That's, that's like CSI. Okay? We know it went to Western Europe. So it occurred to me that, that even though it doesn't enter the documented record until 1353, 1355, we have an environmental journey. And wouldn't it be interesting to know, uh, and Dr. Ian Wilson did this many years ago, part of this many years ago, was to suggest that there are objects in the record that are being venerated as the burial linen of Christ, but they're not called the Shroud of Turin. Yeah? St. Athanasius of Alexandria in the year 327 is writing in a homily that there's a great tradition of the church that there was a, a relic an image of our Lord at full length, he calls it, that was taken from Jerusalem to Antioch in the year 70. That's when Jerusalem fell. And it was taken to Antioch. Well, guess what? Paulins placed this cloth in Antioch. There is a legend that comes out of Edessa that the king Apgar of Edessa was cured of leprosy from an image of Christ. We know that Justinian, the emperor, in the year 525, says this image is in Edessa and it spared the city from a flood. There's a transfer record of the burial linen of Christ from 525 in Edessa. It goes to Constantinople in the year 944. It's received into the emperor's relic inventory and recorded as the burial linen of Christ. 944. It stays in Constantinople until 1204 and it disappears. And this is how we know that. There's a knight named Robert de Clary who wrote a diary. He was on the Fourth Crusade. And he says, every Friday at the church of St. Mary de Blecarny, there is an image of our Lord stood straight up for the faithful to venerate. When that city fell, it disappeared. And where it went, no one knows, neither Latin nor Greek. Okay, 1204. 1204 to 1355, where is it? We got 140 years plus we can't account for, if that's true. No, the Knights Templar did not have it. I love that theory because I love the Templars, but they didn't have it. Um, here's what, here's what I've, I've done a lot of research in. I went, actually went into the Vatican Secret Archives, and I had access to, to the letters of, of Pope Innocent III, all the documentation surrounding the Fourth Crusade, and this is what I believe happened. The cloth was in Constantinople in 1204, and someone took it. As Robert de Clary says, we don't know who, but somebody did. This is what I can tell you that when Pope Innocent III found out they had looted churches and burned churches and stolen relics in Constantinople, he excommunicated every single person he could get the name of, and I've seen the writs, and they're this high. Every single person. He excommunicated them. I know, he writes in a letter, I know you stole relics, I know you took sacred objects, and you are anathema, and you will burn in hell. Now, if you were some knight who had taken the, the burial linen of Christ from Constantinople, what might you do with it? You'd hide it until everybody forgot that Pope Innocent III had everyone under a writ of excommunication. And lo and behold, it turns up in western France, excuse me, in eastern France, in the possession of a knight 
from a chivalrous family, long-standing family of knights, and offers no explanation as to how he came to have it. Isn't that interesting? Now, I have jumped again from the realm of history into the realm of the hypothetical, but it makes perfect sense to me, it's logical to me, that this could explain the journey of the Shroud before 1355. I think you can take it straight back to the tomb if you wanted to. Okay, now, um, I'm going to leave you with this, because this is really interesting. I didn't get to share this the other night, but I did, I did get to share it last night with college students. There is a uh, Emmy Award winning a CGI artist, he's a graphic, uh, not a graphic artist, he's an um, animator who creates um, digital computer code to, to bring 3D characters to life. And so he was super interested in the, in the, uh, the three-dimensional information that's already imprinted in the linen and was curious to see if he could use the technology that he has in the inverse, <laughs> here we go again, in other words, working backwards. So instead of writing the code to create a three-dimensional Disney character, he would use the code that's already been created and, and to reveal the features of the man. Much like you would do with the death mask, for instance, how they used to do in the, in the Middle Ages. He would take a death mask to preserve the image of the face. So I will tell you right up front, this is very compelling work. His name is, is Ray Downing. Um, there was a History Channel documentary done a few years ago, he was part of, where this whole process was, was sort of rolled out. Um, um, it's called um, The Real Face of Jesus, I think is what, that's what the documentary was called, if you wanted to go look it up. But Ray Downing uh, will admit to you, if he were here tonight, uh, and I know Ray, he would say to you, um, I did, uh, I took some liberties. I, we don't know the color of the man's skin. We don't have any genetic information. Um, I don't know what color his hair was. I can tell you what the hair looked like. We can see that on the shroud. You can see the man's got a ponytail on the dorsal side. His hair's pulled up in a ponytail that hangs right between his shoulder blades. I can tell you that, but I can't tell you what color it was. I don't know the color of his eyes. And here's the other thing. The eyes are closed on the shroud. So he took the liberty of the skin color, the hair color, and the eyes are open. And he did that for artistic purposes, okay? So this is what, um, this is what the image is. This one's a little cleaned up version, okay? This is the image that he uses in all of his artworks. He has... Uh, lots and lots of artworks of all the biblical par uh, parables of Jesus and um, this is the the image that he uses for that and this is the one that's not quite so clean he actually left that deliberately on the forehead as a wound so is that the holy face um, yeah that's um, that's a question that you have to answer for yourself because I can lead you this far and I can go no further thank you very much Questions, anybody? Only the ones that I know the answer to. We have a microphone, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll okay. bring you the microphone. Just, there was a hand back there that went up first, right back there. Back here? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a young, young lady over here. Oh. Can I slide by? Sorry, you have to put your hand up again. <laughs> There's a hand up back here? This row? From your, your presentation and the, uh, some of the last comments there, I would assume that you do not agree with what I've read. It's just some recent talk about the image of Jesus in the shroud standing as compared with laying down. Yeah, uh, I don't I, agree with that. I, I, I mean, I, I could see that, but mm -mm. has that been around before? Yeah, that, I think they trotted that out like in the early, maybe the early um, 1990s. Uh, that idea based on blood flow, blood spatter, but all of the forensic testimony contradicts that. The body was vertical at some point. Immediately following death, it was still vertical, but then it was placed horizontally. We know that from the blood flow. Yes? Uh, one, uh, I guess, common rebuttal that I've heard about the, uh, the shroud's accuracy or legitimacy is that 5'10 is so much taller than the average Hebrew man of the first century that it's question. almost inconceivable that his stature would not have been mentioned in the Bible if he was really that tall. 
Yeah. So that's something I've heard that I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Absolutely. I have a lot of thoughts about that. He's not tall. Um, we have actually ossuaries. You know, Jewish, Jews have this practice of allowing the body to decay, and then they place, gather the bones and put them in an ossuary, a bone box. We've got femur measurements from the ancient world, and we know that men were between about five foot nine, five foot ten. I mean, this was not, this was not abnormally tall. He would not have stood out. This is somebody that, if this is Jesus of Nazareth, he had a Mediterranean diet, right? And he was healthy, weighed 160 pounds. This is somebody that's fit. And um, five foot ten inches tall is not tall for the ancient Jewish world by any scientific or anthropological measure we have. I'll tell you what is odd. He's not a medieval European. A medieval European would be about five foot five or five foot six because of their diets and because, again, we have, we have remains we've excavated in battlefields and done femur measurements, and we can get a pretty accurate uh, sort of height reference. So thank you for asking that question because that's something I always like to talk about. This is too tall to be a medieval European. Yes. You mentioned... You mentioned, I think you mentioned about the halfway mark that the wound in the side yes. was, you said, four, four, five inches long. It's long. Um, what would you say caused it? Because we, yeah. we know what, we, we know do. the, ro we know one of them thrust at his side with a lance, right. but we also know that the Roman, that the Roman Pila had a, relatively small head so mm -hmm. what would you say caused mm -hmm. the wound in his side it's a lance it's a roman lance it's a little larger than a pilum um and actually that's been forensically demonstrated you know it's the same thing you can look at a wound and say this is the kind of weapon that caused it we know the width and breadth and depth of that weapon and it aligns with the roman lance Uh, my question is, I have heard in other documentaries that the image of the shroud lines up perfectly with the Divine Mercy yes. image. Yes. Can you speak to that? St. Faustina's uh, vision of the, of the Divine Mercy image. Yes, there are many, many points of congruity uh, between the face and the, the face of the Divine Mercy image. Yeah. Were there uh, coins on his eyes? Coins on the eyes. That's a, that's a great one. That's a great question. So several, I mean, that's maybe, it might have been a couple of decades ago now, there was um, some speculation that imaging photographers could see the outline of an ancient uh, lepton. It's called a lepton, a widow's mite coin, uh, that there was one on each eye. And, um, and that, had, that kind of generated a lot of curiosity and a lot of study. Uh, some imaging specialists said they couldn't see it. The man that I know who has photographed the shroud more than anybody in the world, Barry Schwartz, who was on that original 1978 team, he doesn't see it. Um, some have said that it's like, it's like matrixing, like you're trying to bring order of something that's there that's not really there. But it is an open question. I like to leave that. If you think about how we might rank the evidence, there's, there's um, for those in the, in the shroud world, we think of it in terms of that which is like the top notch. There's category one. There's like this, everybody agrees on this, right? Category two, category three, category four. I would say that that's probably category four. It's still interesting to us, and I think it merits more study. I just can't pronounce on its authenticity. Yeah. We have time for just a few more questions. Okay. Yes, Professor. Uh, was there dirt uh, examined on the shroud that was consistent with perhaps uh, dirt found inside the Holy Sepulchre? The Holy Sepulchre. Sepulchre. Well, okay, so um, that was a big question all of us had. Remember uh, just a few years ago when they did the, um, um, I don't know how to say it, the, the, the renovation, if you will, of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, and everybody was, was curious about that. Unfortunately, we didn't get any samples. Um, it is a limestone. And um, it is a similar type of limestone, but it's consistent with tombs in that general area. So it's not specific to the sepulcher. I wish it were. <laughs> Considering that Jesus took all his DNA from Our Lady 
And this image was created supposedly to be, you know, very similar to what he looked like. Has anyone ever um, attempted to create an image of Our Lady that would be more believable according to this science? No. The quite y'all heard the question about image of Our Lady. No, and and I do want to say this. Although I don't understand the process, and I don't pretend to understand how God would do this. But I want to remind you that as um, a core Christian foundational belief for us is that Jesus was fully God, and he was fully human. And we cannot lose that perspective. Because if we ever get a DNA sequence on him, I don't know how God would do it, but he has to be fully human. He has to be. That is consistent with what we believe about him. And it's going to be reflected right down to his genetic level, however that would happen. Okay? So I'm sorry I went on a little tangent, but I hear that question sometimes. Well, he's only got, you know, 13 chromosomes. I'm like, no. No, he's fully human. Right? Yes. Um, do we know or do you know how bright the light, when Jesus was resurrected, how bright the light was? How bright the light that's a great question. So there are some in theoretical physics who have speculated this to be on the order of 784 trillion watts of power in an immeasurable millisecond. And watts, of course, is, 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 um, is light energy um, or light. 784 trillion watts is enough to power Manhattan Island for a year. So that gives you some perspective of how bright that light must have been. And this will be our final question of the evening. Hi. I no longer remember where I heard the story, but I know that at some point I heard that the shroud had been folded up to a point where you just saw his face right. and that it was in Constantinople and that it was used as uh, like, a, like a figure for artists to draw off of and right. that any kind of paint chips that were on the shroud right. were from this process. Is, is that accurate? Am I remembering that Yeah, there's that been right? a lot of work in art histor in, uh, among art historians about that. I think that has some validity to it. We know that from the fold lines of the shroud, we can recreate that and know that even when it was in the 1532 fire, it was folded in such a way that it would, probably was only the face that was visible. So we can recreate that. And I think it makes perfect sense that they would have made copies of it. We know there was a copy in Lee Ray, um, that was done, that's recorded in the historical record. They made a copy. You know, someone painted a copy. Um, but it's, it was just that, it was a copy. So, great question. Thank you all for your Thank questions. Thank you so much. Oh, I feel like a Lamar now. Thank you again, Dr. White. And please everyone remember that we do have a wine and cheese reception right now for anyone to take part of. And Dr. White will be here at her table. Thank you again.